We're in our series called The Secret Sauce of Prayer and Fasting. We're going to put a bow on this today. This is part seven, talking about prayer and fasting, the secret sauce. We started out the year with our prayer and fasting, 21 days, and, and we've been talking about prayer and what that means. So if you've got your worship guides, pull those out. Your sermon notes are available there. You want to follow along, or if you use the YouVersion Bible app, you can follow along there as well. The sermon notes are available on those. And uh, get your Bibles out. We believe, we're convinced that every time we open the Bible, God wants to speak to us. So we get excited about opening up and hearing what he has to say to us. So if you got your Bibles today, let's open them up to Matthew chapter 21. Woohoo! Matthew 21. Happy about God's word. We've been talking about prayer, been giving you basic principles for establishing prayer in your life. And maybe your prayer life is just out of the universe. It's been fantastic. Maybe you're a little intimidated by prayer. Maybe you're not sure about prayer. Maybe you're like, God is good. God is great. Greater is good. I don't even know that one. I need to learn that prayer. That was pretty complicated. You know what I'm talking about. I'm about your food. and Yeah, let's butcher that. Let's rewind that. I don't even remember what that phrase is. Anyway, you maybe your prayer life is whatever. We're online. We're recording. Like, this is live. This is great. So, but wherever your prayer life is, maybe it's as bad as mine is, evidently. We want to take a little bit of the mystique out of it and help you connect with God, we've been talking about some basic principles, when and where to pray, set a time and a place. Pray that you're doing that every day. You set a time and a place that you connect with God. Well, how long do I have to do it? I don't know how long. You just start out. Give him 10 minutes. Give him 15 minutes. Whatever it is, you just set a time and place where you pray, nothing else. Then what do we pray? Number two, we was about praying word-based prayers. We pray God's word back to him, not just what we want, but it's what he's already said to us. And then how do we pray? We pray bold and we pray believing. We talked about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Said us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. We come how? We come. Boldly. How we coming? Boldly. We coming. We coming boldly. So we coming and we ain't backing down. Right? We coming. We coming. So we're praying bold prayers. We're believing that. Maybe you got uh, in your insert, in your worship guide, we're talking about how to pray bold prayers. We believe God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. Let me say that again. We believe that God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. It's like praying prayers that only he can meet. So I, we gave this little bold prayer list for you. And here's what I'm challenging you. We talked about this on first Wednesday and maybe you weren't able to be here. And I, I spoke about Abraham and Sarah and how God told Abraham and Sarah, and remember they were 90 and, and hundred years old. And he told them, he came and spoke to them and said, hey, you guys are going to have a baby. And they were like, ha, 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 ha. You know, they, they laughed. A lot. Don't be like, you wouldn't be laughing if somebody told you when you were 90 years old you are going to have a baby. I mean, you'd be laughing too. So, but they laughed. <laughs> yeah, somebody may be crying. <laughs> crying, laughing. It's kind of a cycle. Anyway, so we're going to pray bold prayers. And so here's what I'm asking you to put on your list this year. I want you to pray. I want you to spend some time thinking about this. And I want you to write down some things that you're believing God for, that you're praying for. Not the Christmas. This is not a Santa Claus wish list. These are things that God's told you, promised you in your word that you want to believe for, for your family, for your finances, for your health, whatever. I want you to write down prayers that if you told someone, it would make them laugh. That's how bold I want you to go. That if you told somebody what you're praying for, they'd be like, <laughs> that'd be whatever. I want you to write down that coworker that no one thinks would ever get saved. I want you to write down that friend at school that no one thinks that it'll ever come to church or no. I want you to write down that health issue or that financial issue, that marriage. I want you to pray bold prayers. Put it somewhere where you see the sticking in your Bible because we're coming boldly to the throne of grace. Somebody say, we coming. Habakkuk 1.5 says this, look among the nations and watch, be utterly astounded for I will, this is God talking, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. I believe God's saying this, even if God told you what he wants to do in your life, you wouldn't believe it. That's how big God dreams. He dreams big. So he says, this is the way I want you to start praying. So we're excited about that. I want to give you a quick heads up for next week. We're praying bold prayers at the Rhodes Church. We're believing that we need to make room for more people. 
We're praying bold prayers because we're believing for more locations. We're praying bold prayers because we're believing there are more people that need to come to know Jesus as their Savior. Yes. So here's what we're doing. The next two weeks, we're going to be renovating the auditorium where you're sitting in now. We're making some room. We'll be cutting back the stage, changing the sound booth a little bit. We're going to be installing new uh, sound system, new screens, new projectors. We believe some of these changes, we're going to be able to get as many as 60 extra seats in this room. So we're going to be doing that for the next two weeks. So guess what we're going to do for the next two weeks? We're all going to the overflow room. So if you've never been past the cafe foyer to the overflow room, next Sunday is your Sunday. You want to invite somebody. If you're watching online, you need to be here next Sunday. We're all going to gather together in the overflow room, and we're going to pack everybody in there. We've got plenty of room. We're going to make it work. It's going to be an exciting time because then March, the first Sunday in March, is that March 1st, March 2nd? March 1st, we're going to come back in here and you'll be like, what? It's going to be totally different. So uh, we're excited about that. So tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your enemies, tell everybody, come next Sunday, be a part of it. Have you found Matthew chapter 21 yet? We're excited because God's making room for more people at the roads. We're excited. We've got changes coming to Mount Carmel. We'll be back at Mount Carmel tonight. We've got new things coming there. So we're just pumped about what God is doing. Let me start. Let's go. Matthew 21. Verse 18 it says, now in the morning, it's talking about Jesus. As he returned to the city, he was hungry and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. Withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, or truly, I say to you, or pay attention. This is really the truth, what I'm getting ready to tell you. If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what is done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it is life to those who find it, health to all of our flesh. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will just bring it to life in a way that we understand what you're speaking to us. I pray that it will burn in our hearts today, God. Lord, you said that you will sanctify us or set us apart by your word. Your word is truth. And Lord, I thank you. You said that we would know the truth and the truth will make us free. So Lord, I thank you for those watching online, those listening by CD, those watching uh, on YouTube. Lord, I praise you, those watching right here in the auditorium, that your truth will set us free today for the glory of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, we've been talking about praying bold and praying believing. This is, again, the last installment on this series. We're talking about praying, believing. Look here in verse 21 of chapter 21. Jesus had just cursed the fig tree, it withered away. And they, they tr asked him, you know, how did this fig tree wither away? And so Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I'd say to you, if, everybody say if, if, if you have faith and do not doubt. So here's what I want you to do today. I want you to listen. I want you to open up. My heart is for you to really understand with clarity what God is saying. My heart, if you're new to me, my part as a presenter, as a preacher, as a speaker, whatever you want to call it, is to never entertain or for you to be impressed with me, but for you to have this moment during the sermon when you're like, oh, it comes to you and it makes sense for you to understand the word. Because if we don't understand the word, then we can't apply the word. You can be entertained by a performance and it never changed your life. But I'm praying for the word to come alive in your heart where you're like, oh, I get it. I get it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to break this down and we'll teach a little bit on it because I want us to understand pray, what does praying believing mean? Does it matter if I pray believing or does it just matter just if I'm praying? So praying believing. Here's what he says. If you have faith and do not doubt. So the word if is a conditional word. I gave you the definition there in your notes according to Webster, but I also have it on the screen for you. It means in the event that... Or allowing that on the assumption that or on condition that. So if, if you have faith and do not doubt. So if is saying in the event that you have faith and do not doubt. Allowing that or in the assumption that on the condition that these things happen. So if this part has to come first. If, that, that word if is a conditional statement. So if you have faith and do not doubt. So if you have what? If you have, everybody say faith. 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 What does it mean? If you have faith. Here's what the word faith means. To believe to the extent of complete trust and reliance on, to be firmly persuaded. To, be in, to, to have faith, 
does not mean that you have want. You can want something to happen and it not be faith. Faith, according to this Greek word, means to believe in or trust in and to be firmly persuaded like you rely on something, like you're totally convinced. That's what it means to have faith. If you are firmly persuaded, you're, you're thoroughly convinced of something, to have complete reliance. One, one example, I tried to think of a lot of examples we could use. One thing might be that uh, like something that you're so common, so used to doing something that uh, you just become so in faith, like even flipping a light switch. How many of you, when you go into a room, you flip the light switch, you just assume it's going to come on? Like you don't sit there as you're getting ready to switch it and go, oh, Jesus, come on. Oh, I pray today it comes on. Like you just, a lot of times we flip on the switch, we're already halfway in the room before the bulb goes, you're like, what happened? You're shocked. Here's the example. Faith is when you're shocked when it doesn't happen. Like when that light doesn't come on, you're like, You're, you're trying to figure out why, because it always comes on, right? Well, that's kind of an illustration of how faith works. He says, if you have faith, so we, we'll know faith is alive in us by our actions. How do I know if I have faith? My actions will tell me. James chapter 2 says this, verses 19 and 20. If you, or says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is what? It's dead. dead. Faith without works is dead. So how do I know that faith is alive in my heart? You're asking, well, Chad, how do I know? If Jesus said, if you have faith, how do I know if I have faith? Well, he says, your actions and your words should line up with what you believe. I can't, I'm not in faith if my actions say one thing and my words say something else. That's not in faith yet. Faith is when my works are supporting what I say I believe. If I say I believe that this is going to work out, but then I go over here and I badmouth it and I talk about it, and I say it's probably never going to work, then I'm not in faith yet. I'm in want. Yeah, yeah. To make the transition into faith is when my actions start to line up and I truly treat that person like I believe by faith that they are. Yeah. I, I treat my marriage like I'm believing for it to be not according to how it is. By faith, my actions have to line up. I'm just believing God things are going to turn around in my marriage. Okay, well, how are your actions lining up with what you're believing? Or do you go, I'll tell you what, man, that spouse are terrible. I don't know what's wrong with them. So my words and my actions. So if I'm in faith, he said, faith without works is. So if I'm in faith, if I know faith's alive, my actions are going to support it. So he says, if you have faith, if you have faith, what does that mean to have it? There's this little bit of grammar, but I think it's important for us to understand the word. The word have there is a verb, if you have faith, means to hold or possess, to control over the use of. It's a present active tense verb. So when it says you have faith, that means it's present tense active. That means you are, it is actively working in you right now or you are in a state of being. You have, you have entered in a place where faith is active in your life. You're not, I'm hoping to get it, but if you have faith, Jesus said, that means you hold it, you possess it, you have control of it in your life. This is what he's talking about, present tense active faith. That's how Jesus says we got to live. Present tense, active faith. We got to have faith. How, what kind of faith do we got to have? When I'm firmly convinced and firmly persuaded and it's active in my life. All right? Everybody say active. That's what have faith means. It means it's got to be active. So now if he says, if, if we can have it, that also means it's possible not to have it. Are you tracking with me? If he says, if you have faith, that means it's possible to not have faith. Look what it says if we don't have it. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. This says, for we know without faith, it is impossible, everybody say impossible. impossible, impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So without faith, so it is possible to not have faith, without faith, it's impossible to please him. It's impossible, you can't do it. Now, when you read this, be careful. Maybe you're like me. When I, when I read this, initially, I think impossible to please God. We think that please means in the context of either making him happy or mad. Like, if I don't have faith, God's going to be mad at me. That's not what it means. 
It doesn't mean that if I don't have faith, God's going to be mad at me. Or if I don't have faith, God's not going to be happy. That's not what it means. God's already made up his mind how he feels about you. Whether you have faith or not, he loves you. He's not waiting to see if you have faith to decide how he feels about you. He's already convinced that he's crazy about you. So what that means, impossible to please him, is not about whether I keep him from being mad or not, but it means whether I can experience everything he wants me to experience or not. Without faith, it's impossible to please him means without faith, I can't experience everything God wants me to have because some things that God wants you and I to experience requires faith. Requires faith. So without faith, it's impossible to please him. I understand what that means now. That without faith, I'm never going to experience everything that God has for my life. In other words, there are certain places in your life you're just going to have to believe God. You're going to have to trust him by faith. To walk in the things that God has for you, it's going to take faith for you to step in the door. You're not going to be able to please him. You're not going to be able to experience it. Does that make sense to everybody? Without him, you're you're not going to be able to please him. But notice the next part, he says, he who comes to God must believe, must believe. He who comes to God must believe. So we're coming to God, we must believe. We can think this verse means that if we have enough faith, then God will do something. We can think, okay, and sometimes you, people have been taught this, and I want to correct some things that maybe been erroneously taught or erroneously understood about the kingdom of God. We've thought sometimes that if I have enough faith, it will get God to do something. That if, if God didn't do it, it's because I didn't have enough faith for it, so he didn't do it. I want to correct some wrong theology. It is theologically incorrect to think that what God does is tied to our faith. And here's what I want to explain. If that was the case, then we would have say-so on what God does or does not do. We are not that big. We need to bring ourselves down a pay grade or so. (laughs) My faith doesn't tell him what to do. My faith doesn't make him do. He does what he does based on his will. On what he wants to do. Faith doesn't make him do. Faith connects me to receive what he's already done. Faith doesn't impress God so that he will act. Faith, God acts and gives us the opportunity to receive by faith. We thought sometimes if I can just pump up my faith, then God will do something. No, that's wrong. God's deciding what he wants to do based on his heart and based on his will, based on his word. So my responsibility for faith is not to get him to do, but to receive what he's already done. Let me illustrate it for you. God spoke this to me, and maybe maybe it'll work, and it'll connect. Faith, maybe you've heard some of this said, faith is the currency of heaven. Maybe you've heard it said like that. Let me give you an illustration. Your faith, if you want to compare your faith to currency or money, let's talk about the store. Let's talk about the grocery store. Did your money, i.e. faith, put those groceries on the shelf? So were they waiting to put the groceries on the shelf? Were they waiting to see how much money you had before they put it out there? No. Don't don't feel embarrassed. You can can say no. (laughs) So your faith had nothing to do with what was made available, or your money had nothing to do with what was made available at the grocery store. The grocery store decided what was available. Now what you do is you give them money, And that money allows you to take what was theirs into your possession and you can take it home. So your money didn't provide the options, but your money makes the exchange to receive what's already been provided. So now understand this with faith. My faith doesn't make God make things available. He makes things available by grace. He makes things available by his heart, by his will, what he wants to do. My faith just puts it in my cart. 
You're processing. That's all right. It took me a while to get it to. Just imagine this. When I go to the store, I was just there the other day. I'm pushing my cart down the aisles. The manager was not walking down the aisle with me, putting stuff in my cart and saying, this is what you will eat tonight. He was not saying, you need this. You need that. You need that. He put it all out there available. She put it all out there available. But it was up to me to decide what I wanted that was available on the shelf and put it in my cart. Yes. Yes. And that's what I decided to receive. There could be things available on the, on the shelf that I chose not to get. But it doesn't mean it wasn't available. Somebody else coming behind me, they wanted that. They grabbed that on the shelf. I passed it by. This is why we got to understand our faith. That whenever we come to God, that God's, this is right here is our grocery store of the promises of God. And so whenever we come through here, we got to realize that when we release our faith to believe that we are receiving everything that God has for us, he's not the one determining what we put in our car. We are receiving it by faith. Is that connecting with you? So too many times we think that God's supposed to put things in our cart whenever he wants to put them in our cart. And we realize he puts them on the shelf. He just puts everything on the shelf for you. He says, here it is. Now you bring your card along and by faith you receive what he's, he's already made available. So my faith is not making God do something for me. He's already done it. He's already provided for me. And we'll, we'll connect with this and I hope you see what we're talking about. So he says, if we have faith and do not doubt. If we have faith and do not doubt. What does it mean to doubt? That means to be separated in contrary di directions. You got two different opinions. James chapter 1 says, that we ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed and driven by the wind. And that person is double-minded and unstable in all their ways. And let not that person think they'll receive anything from God. So it tells us when Jesus said, if you have faith and you do not doubt. What is he teaching us? He's teaching us how to receive from God. Now, this is why sometimes we'll gravitate towards a theology or a teaching that says, you know what, I just push my cart and God just puts in there everything that he wants. And I'm telling you, that's why we don't receive everything that God has for us. Yes. We've got to grab it off the shelf by faith and receive it. God's already provided it for us. But he says, don't doubt, don't doubt. That means that I don't vacillate between two opinions. Double-minded means I believe God will do it in one sense, and then I don't believe he'll do it on the other. And I go back and forth and back and forth. And he says, you will not receive what God has for you because you can't settle on one position. You're not convinced yet. One day you think it's going to happen. The next day you don't think it's going to happen. You're double-minded. And he says, you will not have present active faith as long as you're double-minded. That's not to beat us up. It's to teach us what to do. That when I'm double-minded, I'm like, oh, I got to get my mind single-minded. I got to get focused on what God says and tell that doubt to get out. I'm believing God. I'm believing God. He said, if you have faith and do not doubt, look what happened. Jump down to verse 22. If you have faith and do not doubt, and whatever things you ask in prayer believing, you will receive. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing. That word believing is the same word for faith. It means to believe to the extent of complete trust or reliance on. So whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. What does receive mean? Again, receive is where you accept something, where the initiative is on the part of the giver, but the transfer is on the part of the receiver. In other words, somebody makes it available. Last week I used the donuts. This week I'm talking about grocery store. I'm all about the food. That somebody makes it available, but the transfer is on your side to receive what they're giving you. This is what he's telling us. Whatever things, so no, let's put the verse together. If you have faith and do not doubt, if you have present, active, firmly convinced, firmly persuaded faith, and you're not double-minded, you're not wavering, then whatever things you ask in prayer that you believe, that you're convinced of, those are the things you will receive. Those are the things you will grab hold of. The things that you aren't convinced yet, you won't grab hold of even if you still want them. Am I making sense to you? If I'm, if I'm walking through the store and I see a new product, a new type of food, if I'm not sure how it's going to taste, I'm probably not going to take it off the shelf. 
Go to a restaurant. I'm trying to find any way I can, and I'm using food for all my illustrations because I'm hungry. <laughs> you go to a restaurant. You ever gone to a restaurant and looked at a menu? I mean, he knows this. You go to a place, and you get the same thing every time you go to that same place because you know you like it. Come on, raise your hands, you know? Yeah, yeah. There are a bunch of other things on the menu, lots of other options, but you know if you go there and you get what you like, you know you're going to like it. So you're like, man, you hate to risk it and try something new because what if it's bad and you wasted your chance to get what you know you like? I can name you three or four places right now. I've never wavered off of the same thing because I like it so much and I'm just not sure what will happen if I risk it and what if it's not good? Right? Well, let's put that to the kingdom of God. There are certain things that we're convinced of and we'll receive from God. There are certain things that we're not sure about, so we don't receive it. There are certain things we know God wants us to have. We're convinced by faith. Let me, let me give you some examples. We're going to receive these things. How come um, we understand this where forgiveness of sins is concerned, salvation is concerned? We know this. So let's bring up Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to use the example about this that I think is something you'll be convinced you'll be convinced of. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Notice what it says, for by grace, by grace. Everybody say by grace. By grace. You have been saved through through what? Through faith. through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. By grace are you saved through faith. So let me ask you this question, very important question. You ready? I'm, I'm trying to phrase it the right way so you won't think it's a trick question. I, was, I don't want to make these questions hard. I want to make them easy to understand. Um, um, <laughs> did God wait to save you based on your faith? How are you saved? By, by grace. Did God, let me say it this way. Did God wait for your faith to forgive you? He already made up his mind to forgive you. He provided forgiveness by grace. It's a gift of God. Your faith doesn't get God to forgive you. He already forgave you by grace. But how do you, how do I receive that forgiveness through? You see it? So I, my faith doesn't make God forgive me. My faith receives what God's already done. By grace, I've been saved. So if we understand that for forgiveness of sins, how come we don't understand that and apply that to every other area of our life? Because the gospel has been preached for so many years so well that people believe that if I just pray, if I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I will be saved. And they have faith for that. They just believe it. They just believe it's possible. If I just pray, God's going to forgive me and I'm going to be saved. Their faith grabs that off the shelf. Salvation available by grace, aisle two. You grab it. You're like, ah, I believe that. I'm going to heaven. How do you know you're going to heaven? Because I believe. How do you know you're going to heaven? You don't look saved to me. Well, I'm going. How do you know? By faith. I receive it. I understand that. Well, how about we go over to aisle three? Some people never go past aisle two. They, they receive salvation, forgiveness of sin by faith. But when God says, that's great, but that's just the door. I want you to go to aisle three and see what else I got for you. Or maybe open curtain number three. Yeah, yeah. Curtain number four, let's make a deal. <laughs> too, many, too many times in our life, we don't go past that. That we've got faith to receive that. But we think that everything else... It's just up to God to give us. And I'm telling you, there is more to it that we have to receive through faith. Let's bring up the next, next scripture. Let me show it to you. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, unto salvation to everyone who, wait a minute, no, 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 no surely that's not right. To everyone who, Please. so salvation is limited to who? To those who believe. 
Is it limited to them because it's not available? Or is it limited to them because they don't receive? They don't believe. Salvation is available to everyone, but not everyone's going to receive it. Not everyone's going to believe it. Salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. Go to the next verse, verse 17. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Hold up, hold up, revealed. Revealed, what does that mean? Revealed. Is revealed, revealed, revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. What does that mean? Well, I keep asking, Chad, you're not answering me. What is it revealed? It means this. It means it's already there, you just haven't seen it yet. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to, hold up, hold up. I hope you're catching this. I'm dropping bombs here. I just want you to pick up on this. See, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It's not that my faith makes God do for me. It's that my faith causes me to see what he's already done. I'm going to see more of what God has already provided for me when I trust him by faith. If I don't believe there's anything beyond aisle two, he can't show me aisle three. He can't show me aisle 27. It's revealed from faith to faith because it is written the just shall live by so how are we going to experience everything God has for us? By faith. you got to believe it. Most of the time, and I, I get it. I, I realize I'm not speaking to everybody because not everybody is going to engage in this. Most people will fall back to the theology of just, you know what, if God wants me to have it, he'll have it, and I don't have any responsibilities here whatsoever. That's much easier. That's a much easier way to live. I have no responsibilities for my life. If God wants it to happen, it's going to happen. If he doesn't want it to happen, it's not going to happen. So we will just default into that and call ourselves good. But we will never experience everything that God has for us because we're not walking by faith. That's not to condemn us, not to make us feel bad about ourselves. It's to give us the formula, the pattern to experience everything that he has for you. Let me, let me close with this. Let me give you a couple examples. The woman in Matthew chapter 9 with the issue of blood. She had blood, the blood issue for 12 years. Touched, she said, she came behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment. Notice how she was in faith. Notice her actions and her words. If only I may touch his garment. Notice how she was persuaded. Notice how she was convinced. I shall, what she say? I shall be made well. Was she in faith? Did her actions prove it? She pushed through the crowd. And she said, she said to herself, if I only may touch the hem of his garment. Notice what she didn't say. She didn't say, well, I'll, I'll go through and I'll touch his garment. We'll just see what happens. No, in faith, she said, this is what's going to happen. When I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. Now, whether you believe that or not, she believed it. She walked through there. She pressed through the crowd. She went down on the bottom shelf of the store. It said, I'm going to pull me some healing out. Did she get it? Look what it says. Jesus turns around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. You're like, aha, see? See right there. Her faith caused Jesus to heal her. No, 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 it didn't. No, it didn't. Because if you read this another place in the Bible, Jesus didn't, didn't even know who it was. He asked, who touched me? Who touched me? So it wasn't her faith caused him to heal her. Her faith tapped into what was already available. Our faith doesn't make God do. We're not in control of God. We're not bossing God around. We're not telling him what to do when we want him to do it. Our faith is receiving what's been available to us through the blood of Jesus and by him dying on the cross for us. It's more than aisle two. It's more than the forgiveness of sins. He's got a whole store of stuff for us. We just have to receive it by faith. Last thing. Mark chapter 9, or Mark chapter 6, sorry. Jesus goes to his hometown. What could rob us? What could keep us from receiving? He says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own relatives in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there. He could do. Notice it doesn't say that he would do no. He says he could do no mighty work here except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief. 
What stopped Jesus from doing everything that he wanted to do? What stopped those people from experience everything that Jesus wanted them to experience? It was their unbelief. According to Jesus, that village, he came to heal everyone in that village. He had just come, if you read back, he had just come from a place where everybody was healed. But he comes to his hometown. And because familiarity sets in, they were double-minded. On one side, here's what happens. Man, you got to watch this. Here's how we got to watch double-minded. On one side, they heard, this is the Messiah, the Son of God. On the other side, they heard, that's Joseph's boy. That's just Mary's boy. I remember him when he was 12 years old working in Joseph's shop. He built me a chair that fell apart. I remember that. I believe all of Jesus' chairs held together. I'm just kidding. But whatever. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? On one part, they wanted to believe that he was the son of God. But on the other side, they believed he was the son of Joseph. They were double-minded. Because they were double-minded, Jesus said, I, I, I can't do much because you don't believe that I'm the answer to your problem. I, I want to heal you, but you think I'm just Jesus, son of Joseph. I'm Jesus, son of God. How we see him is how we'll receive from him. Let me close with this. I was reading through the Bible this week. I read through the Bible every year, and I was just coming through my reading. I was reading about the book of Job. I was finishing up the book of Job. And I found this scripture in, in Job chapter 40. And I came to this scripture, and, and when I came to it, God said, uh, that's you. And I said, no, no, uh, no, no, it's not, Lord. And he said, yes, it is. And here's what it said. This is after, set it up for you. This is after uh, Job had been telling God how right he was and how righteous he was, and I've been doing everything right. God, I've served people. I've helped people. I've done everything right. I've never done anything wrong, but God, you're falling asleep with the wheel. You're not holding up your end of the bargain. I've held up my end, but how come you haven't held up your end? Remember that? So he's telling God how to do his job, and here's what God says to him in Job chapter 40, verse 8. He says, would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? I read that and the Lord said, that's you. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? He said, when something doesn't go your way and it doesn't work the way you want it to work, you're very quick to defend yourself and throw me under the bus. Later on in the scripture, Job says, Lord, I'm going to paraphrase. I'm a bum. I, there, you, your works are too wondrous for me to know. In other words, God, I'm sorry that I accused you of wrongdoing. Your ways are something beyond me. Because God starts asking, were you there when I created this? Were you there when I created that? Here's what I'm telling you. Too many times we defend our faith, say we're fine. God's falling asleep. And God's speaking to our hearts, say, listen, if you prayed for something, believing for something, and it didn't happen, where we start examining is not God. We start examining ourselves. We don't start blaming God and say, hey, God, how come you didn't? We look at ourselves and say, God, all right, teach me. What do I need? Because there could be something that we don't understand totally beyond us. And I come to encourage somebody today, not to beat you down, but to tell you, hey, pray believing again. Thanks so much for watching with us. We love our online family and we invite you to connect with us. We have a few different ways you can do that on our website at theroads.church as well as on social media. You can text to give by texting the amount space roads to 45777. And we'd love to pray for any needs you might have. So send us a message and let us know how we can partner with you in bringing the light and love of Jesus to your world.